Aaron, thank you so much for coming on today for the deep dive on Booker Lapuk. So um, maybe just for to start us off with, in its simplest form, could you explain Booker Lapuk and its business model just for us? Sure. So uh, Booker Lapuk is basically an Indonesian e-commerce company. Uh, it uh, it primarily uh, caters to the lower income uh, segment of the population. So as you know, Indonesia is still a pretty low income per capita country, uh, or rather an emerging market, right? And it has, uh, it has uh, the government does uh, categorize something called the MSME segment, which means micro, small, and medium enterprises. Whereas most countries just do SME, right? The distinction here being that micro uh, is attributed to uh, what they call the warungs or the stalls translated where the warungs are pretty much 99% of the volume of uh, businesses in Indonesia. They are pretty much one or two percent operation, uh, sustain, sustenance kind of businesses, where the goal is just to earn enough to feed your family, right? And they're typically roadside stores or, uh, you know, not even a container size store, right? Or even, it could even go up to a typical small business size, which is a proper shop lot. Right, but uh, the idea being that there are a uh, a lower income segment, uh, in excess of the small business, typical small business segment. So Bukalapa caters to the supply chain of these micro businesses, the warungs. Right. Um, if we have time, we can go into the similarities on the Philippines, but you get the parallels, right? And uh, uh, Bukalapa also has another angle to it, which is with the Salim Group, one of the big uh, conglomerates in Indonesia. So I would like to draw a parallel to the tables in uh, Korea, South Korea, right? They're basically a gigantic family dynasty. But of course, we'll go into that later, right? I just wanted to highlight it right now. But pretty much that's why it, it, it caters to the Indonesian warungs on the supply chain side. Yep. Yeah. So... I've been in Indonesia, so I've got a bit more of an idea, but for someone who has never been to Indonesia, could you explain what a warung is and why they're important to book a Yes, yeah, sure. So um, building on the illustration I gave you earlier, the reason why book can treat these uh, warungs as customers, despite being an e-commerce operation, is precisely because they are just one or two main businesses. Because if you think about a typical e-commerce operation, the end customer is actually a B2C relationship, right? A business to customer relationship where they deliver to your door, the last mile kind of thing, right? Uh, in the war room context, Bokalapak is actually having a B2B relationship because they are just fulfilling the supply chain side of the equation, right? Of the retail supply chain. But uh, the reason why they can treat the war rooms as a customer in an e-commerce context it's because they're so small, right? When the business is run just by one or two person, you're effectively a B2C customer, even though substantially you are a B2B customer, right? And uh, we'll go into this later, but uh, they do a lot of food FMCG businesses, uh, uh, sales. Um, so this is why, uh, sorry, this is the relationship between Bukalapa and the Warung. So to go back to your first question, a Warung is basically loosely translated as a stall. Uh, I think in some countries they call them hawkers, right? But while the term hawker is usually associated with uh food sales, right? Uh fresh food sales, in the warung context, they are actually proper FMCG businesses. So that's the distinction. Beautiful. Thank you. So what problem then does Bukalapak solve? And then why does this problem also persist? So the thing is this, um, as I've alluded to earlier, Indonesia is still a pretty low income country. And uh, uh, to draw a contrast to the developed nations, right? The e-commerce operations tend to be nationwide with large economies of scale, uh, punctuated by or bottlenecked by the warehouses, right? The fulfillment centers. So that's where the economies of scale happen in the e-commerce sector. Uh, now coming to Indonesia, the context, the legacy context is that uh, there hasn't really been a lot of e-commerce development, uh, call it pre-COVID. So to this, or at least to the pre-COVID era, there is still a very big uh, presence 
among the brick and mortar uh, distributors. For instance, one of the Salim Group's competitors, another chebo like uh, conglomerate, is called Sinamas, the Sinamas Group. And Sinamas owns basically uh, the biggest uh, brick and mortar retail distributor. So what do I mean by distributor? Just think about the middle mile of your typical uh, e-commerce operation, right? Where they are uh, they are delivering it from the source to the end customer. So that's what we call the middle mile. The last mile is from the warehouse near your near your address to your doorstep, right? So um, even prior to e-commerce in the retail sector, there is a middle mile operation, right? So for instance, in Walmart, in your Tesco's, right? And uh, busy distribution is still a very huge presence in Indonesia as a brick and mortar retail distributor, right? The, 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 the space it occupies in the national retail supply chain. Now let's bring Bukalapak and its peers in. So as I mentioned, uh, Bukalapak doesn't deliver per se to the end customer, it delivers to the warung. So it's a B2B relationship and therefore it fulfills a quasi middle mile, right? Although it more resembles last month. And here's uh, where Bukalapak comes in. They are basically digitalizing busy distributions, physical brick and mortar retail distribution supply chain, right? And bringing an e-commerce solution to it. So what that means is that uh, it cuts out, it, it presumably cuts out the middleman. We'll go into why it doesn't actually do that later, right? And uh, even in the war rooms, uh, most owners have a smartphone. So for you to set up a retail distributor relationship with Bukalapa, it's as easy as downloading an app and filling some forms. So uh, what Bukalapa is trying to do is basically cutting out the middleman, right? Uh, to reduce the cost for the end consumer, right? And also another thing is that with the scale, the, the, the scalability of a digital solution, which is e-commerce, it can actually uh, uh, basically create economies of scale by, uh, let's say, tapping a larger pool of warrants compared to busy distribution requiring physical agents to meet each and every single one, right? So let's say if you can have, uh, I don't know, a million warung customers in Java Island, you could then go to uh, someone like the Salim Group who is selling uh, edible oils, right? and immediately start a middle mile operation, a logistics operation, because you're connecting end to end, right? One is the factory, the other is the war room. So you're fulfilling the supply chain and you can do it with all the typical benefits of a digital operation in e-commerce, which I probably don't need to explain to your viewers. Yep, perfect. And this is a big question, so apologies, but given Indonesia's structure, Java's the main island. And given that Bukalapak's bread and butter is X tier one city, so everything excluding tier one cities, as Indonesia develops, becomes more modernized, and as more cities develop, is this a risk for Bukalapak? And how do they maintain the stranglehold? Oh, how do they maintain this stranglehold on X tier one cities? Because B2C incumbents like Tokopedia or GoTo now, um, Shopee in the tier one cities, what strategy do they employ to sort of combat them? Sure. So just for context, tier one cities draw a parallel to the tier one cities in China, right? They're basically where the bulk of Indonesia's GDP is concentrated. For instance, Jakarta alone uh, is 15% of Indonesia's entire GDP, right? The greater Jakarta area. So uh, just think about something like Beijing or Shanghai, you get the idea, right? And uh, back to your question, um, what risk, sorry, what was the question again? How do they compete with, as more cities develop, become tier one cities, how do they compete and maintain that stranglehold they have, I guess, on the less developed cities as they develop? Sure. So at this point, the X tier one cities are still not attractive enough uh, for basically anyone, including Bukalapak and his peers, to uh, immediately start a profitable operation. So the big boys, like your Tokopedias, your Shopee's, they're not necessarily trying to penetrate the X tier one cities yet. Think about the logistics of it, right? You're dealing with uh, very small ticket sizes, right? Uh, unsophisticated uh, warung owners who need to be taught, 
uh, and very, very large distances, which means few cores, capex, stuff like that, right? And uh, co in contrast to within a tier one city, which has all the trappings of your typical developed nation city, uh, you know, lots of fulfillment centers everywhere, uh, very a lot of uh, high density of customers, right? So lower unit costs. So because of that, uh, none of the big boys, let's put it that way, like Tokopedia or Shopee, are actually bothering with the XK1 cities. For instance, Shopee Indonesia, uh, it might surprise you to learn that it only does digital uh, sales, sales of digital products with the XK1 cities, hmm. right? All the Indonesian revenue that you see on Shopee's uh, disclosures are only within the T1 cities. So for context, there are only five or six T1 cities, right? There's Jakarta, Samarang, Medan. Uh, I can't remember all of them. <laughs> off the top of my head. But you get the point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most of the wealth in Asia is concentrated in the T1 cities. As a result, it just makes a lot more sense to compete there if you can. Now, back to Bukalapak and its peers. So the likes of Bukalapak, uh, the Amazon funded Ula, uh, the the Sinamas funded uh, what is it Warung Digital? What is it what's the competitor's name called? Uh, right, yeah, I, I forgot already. Uh, so, uh, basically, Bukalapak is peers, right? They they are basically left alone to their own devices in this unprofitable land grab, right? To try and uh uh gain the next tier one cities. Right, and given the context, you it's very intuitive to understand that the big boys just are not really a threat to these guys at the moment. Until the day when uh Bukalama and his peers have developed the market to the point where it is actually profitable, mm -hmm. right? So until then, which is probably ten years away, I don't think they need to worry about the likes of Shopee or Tokopedia coming to their turf and decimating them. Right? Like I said, Shopee is only doing sales of digital products. But then the question then becomes, what if after that? Well, it's possible, right? But presumably by then, uh, the likes of Bukalapak and Ula have already developed their first mover advantage in the XT1 cities. They've developed their branding. They've developed their relationships. right? At the B2B level, distributor level, uh, relationships are quite a bit of a mode in contrast to B2C. Right, and um, we'll see what happens then. Right, and uh, if we have time, we'll even explain a little bit more about why it's so interesting for the big boys. But uh, at this point, I don't think you have to worry about the risk of competition from the big boys. Yeah. Cool, perfect answer, love it. And we've touched on it a couple times, but could you explain? And speaking of relationships, but could you explain Bukalapak's partnership with its major shareholder, Slim Group, and why that's so important? And do you want to explain some context there, maybe? Yes, sure. So the Slim Group, uh, for a little bit of context, is basically one of the 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 quasi chabos, right? To use a Korean term. So think about the large family dynasties like LG, Samsung, right? Hyundai is Hyundai a chable, right? In Korea, you have the very same relationship in Indonesia. And uh, just to digress for 30 seconds, the reason is because Indonesia is basically copying Korea's model of economic development, where Korea copied the Zaibatsu model in Japan, right? And in fact, China is doing the same thing, right? So, uh, you know, the world is actually quite small. But uh, here's the thing. Um, uh, so, you know that Salim is basically uh, uh, a chebo itself. And I have a list of tables in, I think, my part two uh, book club article. So um, the its immediate competitor is Cinemas, right? Uh, sorry, just to clarify again, uh, what was your question? Um, just explain just sort of the relationship and, yeah, what that means, having a relationship with a chebol, Indonesian chebol, I guess. Sure, sure. So as you can imagine, in these kind of family dynasties and uh, emerging market nations, right, uh, the economies resemble the medieval times where most of the GDP, so-called, is concentrated in the hands of a few rich families, right? So you can think of them as kings and the government as an emperor, right? So they all have their own terms to protect. For instance, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Salim Group owns Indomie, the largest instant noodle manufacturer by volume in the world, right? So it's definitely a retail champion. It also owns Indo Retail, the country's Tesco, basically, right? 
and uh, its competitor Cinemas owns our. I think Cinemas is palm oil, if I'm not wrong, right? You, you get the point. There are a lot of family entities each controlling certain sectors. So it so happens that Cinemas and Salim Group both have a stranglehold on the retail sector of Indonesia. And where they come into Bukalapak as well as the Cinemas own Wang Pintas uh, presence is that they are basically already controlling the brick and mortar retail industry. They are obviously seeing that that's being disrupted by the digital e-commerce retail industry. And they want to maintain their market share or even grow it, right? Because uh, right, brick and mortar has structural impediments in terms of how far you can grow into the XTR cities. So now with digital, presumably it's actually more economical to do so. And they don't want to leave the land grab to the likes of your Tokopedia and Shopee's, right? They they want to maintain their stranglehold on the retail sector of Indonesia. So uh, this is the attempt to do so. And why is it important? Because like I said, these XTR cities are not profitable yet. So you really need a large backer to just subsidize the heck out of your unprofitable decade-long uh, you know, commitment to this sector. And uh, who better to do it than a uh, ex-growth company, right? a GDP plus growth company like Cinemas or Salim, right? It's basically our next chapter of growth. And the distinction here to be made is that Salim and Cinemas basically already control the brick and mortar retail distribution uh, supply chain, right? which means that they act as gatekeepers to the actual suppliers of the FMCG goods that are being delivered to the warungs, precisely because those uh, source suppliers are also owned by the chambers, right? So oil is owned by Cinemas, uh, bread is owned by uh, uh, Salim, obviously noodles are owned by Salim, rice is also owned by Salim, you get the point, right? So, if you are a new entrant like Bukalapa or Warung Pinta or Ula, without the necessary connections to reach the source, the source supplier, you're only allowed to operate at the downstream of the retail supply chain, right? So, given the size and the complexity of uh, Indonesia's national supply chain, they are basically about five to six layers from the source manufacturer to the war to the to the end customer with the warong being on the, the final sixth tier. The chambers already control the first four tiers. So currently, Bukalapa as new entrant only can penetrate the last two tiers. And as you can imagine, the margins there are not very attractive, right? So they do need to, the, the blessing of the chambers who control the first four tiers to tap into those margins. And that is where Salim, the partnership with Salim, uh, as well as Sinamas, on behalf of, uh, sorry, by Warung Pinta comes in, right? They actually need the blessing of the chambers to start tapping to their margins. And the way they do that is by becoming part of the conglomerate. So that is why independent of the wider context where Bukalapa is part of the Salim group, you are actually not seeing the full picture when you're analyzing Bukalapa. Bukalapa is not a standalone Indonesian e-commerce company. It is the retail arm of uh, or rather the e-commerce arm of the Salim Group. And that's how its valuation should be understood. Perfect. Um, slightly off topic, but still related. But I did note that in your report, you mentioned that overseas Chinese tycoons and their outsized influence on the future of the regional ASEAN economy. Why is this so? Yeah, just curious because how that influences things down the line. What do you think there? Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the Salim Group's owner, or, or rather the current CEO, his name is called Anthony Salim, and he actually inherited the Salim group from his father, which is Sudono Salim. Sudono Salim actually uh, uh, came from Fujian, China. He escaped it when the Japanese invaded China during uh, around the time of the Chinese Civil War. right? So basically, he fled to uh, Indonesia the way the Ukrainians might be fleeing to Moldova right now right? Uh, because of war. right? So they put themselves up from their bootstraps and uh, you know, made the necessary connections, 
got to know uh, Sukarno and President Suharto and uh, build up the Siam Group as he is today. Right? And uh, the thing about Sudono Salim's story is that it's not a unique story. Right? Across the border in Malaysia, you have the likes of Robert Kwok, who basically, uh, although he did not, he wasn't a first generation Chinese the way Sudona was, first generation implying that they flee from China, he was the second generation Chinese. But still, he also built up his connections, right? Pull up from his bootstraps and build up the, the, the Robert Kwok empire that he is today, which owns 40% of China's edible oil markets. Right? And, uh, you cross uh, across the straits, you go to the Philippines, you see Lucio Tan, who basically did the same thing with the Marcos Senior, which is especially relevant today because Marcos Jr. just won as a president, right? So it's the same thing, pulled himself from his bootstraps, uh, gained the political connections, right? You know the story. And then you have Robin Chin in Thailand, doing the same for Bangkok Bank. And to a lesser extent, uh, you have it happen in Hong Kong. Right? And uh, it's just that they weren't dealing with the indigenous peoples. They were dealing with their Hong benefactors, who were basically the British uh, overlords then. But it's the same uh, relationship. It's a political patronage relationship. right? And they're all related by one common thread, which is uh, what the Indonesians derogatorily refer to as the Chukong class. Chukong loosely translates to... Uh, uh, prime servant or something like that, right? <laughs> so it's a servitude relationship to the political patronage class, mm. right? Where there is an element of corruption going on, uh, the the president or prime minister of the indigenous uh country, oh sorry, uh, the indigenous class there, right? Uh, bestows upon these overseas Chinese, uh a monopoly license over certain exports or production or something, right? So in Sudona Salim's case, it was flour as well as uh, palm oil, if I'm not wrong, right? And um, uh, it enforces this Chukong relationship where there is a self-sustaining uh, uh, cycle here because obviously the Chukong supplies funding, right, to the, to the political patron. Whereas the political patriot needs an isolated Chinese, overseas Chinese Chukong, right, to remain loyal to him. And the way he does that is that he uses uh, Achilles heel in the form of the monopoly license, which he can withdraw anytime, hmm. right? And, and this isolated overseas Chinese tycoon uh, is pretty much hated by the other indigenous people because uh, it's corruption <laughs> and he's much richer than them, right? So he's isolated. So it's a very self-reinforcing relationship, right? As opposed to uh, prior to the Chukong class's development, where the political patron would have to rely on a fellow indigenous uh, tycoon who can just leave him anytime, right? For another indigenous political patron. So that's how the Chukong class developed. Sorry, what was your question again? Did I answer your question? No, that's fine. Yeah, it's just sort of understanding the influence there. And yeah, that was great. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. Just let me uh, wrap it up with one last thing. Mm -hmm. So ASEAN as a whole, their economy, if you look back at hindsight, was built on the backs of these overseas Chinese tycoons, right? Given all the context I've given you, uh, the economy became very... Uh, it was developed economically based on this Chukong relationship. There is the common thread in the entire ASEAN economic development of the call it, past 50 years. Which is why we call them the overseas Chinese. Yeah. Perfect. Love that. that oh yeah, love that primer. Um, back to Bukala Park. Do you want to touch on valuation there and just, um, yeah, everything there on valuation about yeah. Bukala Park? Yeah, sure. So Bukala Park's valuation is a pretty simple, uh, not a lot of moving parts, because it's currently trading at about 12 to 13 times price to sales, right? Which was acceptable two years ago, but uh, for some reason, not now, right? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, objectively speaking, a 12x PS is, ratio is quite expensive, right? 
And the reason for that is not necessarily because of its fundamentals per se, right? It's just that I think people have a lot of hope that with the Sime Group's backing, it will eventually develop into a, 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 a comparable retail uh, establishment or rather retail company to Salim Group's existing brick and mortar retail companies, right? So like I said, Bokala Park is part of Salim Group. That is the only way to build its valuation. To ignore it is, uh, will be my myopic, right? And um, so the upside is pretty simple, right? If this thesis of Bokala Park eventually successfully replacing part of the Salim Group's uh, brick and mortar retail entities, uh, it's definitely worth much more than 12 times price to sales because the sales right now is really insignificant even relative to the likes of the big boys, Shopee, Tokopedia, right? Because again, as I said, most of the GDP of Indonesia is concentrated in, in the tier one cities. So presumably that means the X tier one cities have a lot of growth to do. And uh, a bit of context for our viewers, uh, Indonesia has 270, a population of 270 million, right? So that's pretty much what? One fifth of China. <laughs> that's, and it has the largest Muslim population in the world, right? It's the fourth largest population period, right? Country, with fourth largest population. So uh, any economist will tell you that population growth is the most important driver behind GDP growth. And a Bukala Park story is very simple. It's GDP growth, right? So think about Vietnam's uh, projected 7% GDP growth over the next decade. Uh, Indonesia is not there yet, but it will get there. And the base that it's growing from is a lot larger. I would even go so far as to liken the X tier 1 city population growth and GDP growth to China 30 years ago. Right? That's the kind of base we are talking about. So if everything is successfully executed and we have the Salim group behind Bukala Park, I think you agree with me that they can easily justify a 12x PS just from a GDP growth uh, thesis. But of course, there's the risk component, which is that why if it doesn't work out, right? And, uh, you know, it's a bit like Bitcoin where uh, you have 12 to 12 times PS ratio right now, right? And uh, the worst case scenario is that it's worth nothing. So there's a lot to drop, right? So it's really a VC kind of risk reward exposure, right? It can either do extremely well or it can go to zero. And being cognizant of that, the way to approach it would be probably smaller position sizing, right? Just put in whatever you can uh, uh, lose, right? And uh, if it doesn't work out, that's all you lose, right? But it's not really a... 100% sure thing kind of thing. But that's kind of it, right? Because other than that, there's just nothing else to analyze when your PS ratio is 12 times, right? Everything else just falls in the background to revenue. Yeah. Good. No, thank you for the explanation. I appreciate the reasoning. That was, yeah, great summary of it. Um, short and sharp one today. I'm loving this. This is great. But is there anything we haven't touched on that's important about the future of Bukala Park or Indonesia or the Slim Group? Anything else you want to touch on before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. How long do I have? We'll go five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Okay. So um, let me see. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So I think the last thing I'll touch on is the macro context. Because Indonesia is located in what is called the Indo-Pacific zone, right? Which is basically where the axis of geopolitical significance over the next generation is going to be concentrated. So think about post-WTO China in 2001, right? That was where the axis of geopolitical, uh, or rather geoeconomic influence, uh, was concentrated for the past twenty years. Right now that China has become rich, basically, uh, the labor costs of China are no longer tenable for manufacturing. It needs to graduate to a service economy to sustain its growth. And the next China, which is basically the next factory of the world, will need to be a place which qualifies two broad reasons. One, obviously low labor costs, uh, comparable to China 30 years ago. And two, a stable enough political environment, right, which 
allows the labor cost advantage to be executed. So for instance, you may not want to go to Africa, right? You may not want to go to Russia, right? Even uh, Latam or Mexico, right? Is uh, questionable, right? So for whatever reason, ASEAN happens to have a relatively stable political environment, right? So it allows, and also low labor pool costs, as well as large population. What a large population does, sorry, a large and young population. Mm. What a large and young population base does is that not only it provides you with cheap labor, it provides you with a ready consumer base as well, right? With high discretionary income to spend on the products you're producing in their country. So it's a very China-like situation, right? From 20 years ago. And um, this is the reason why I call ASEAN basically the next China, right? And, and from a geoeconomic perspective, you can start to see why Indonesia's macro uh, 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 prospects over the next 10, 20 years are looking very attractive, right? So Philippines uh, has about half of Indonesia's population and the population growth of their working age population is even larger, right? I think from now to 2060, it's basically a straight line. Even India doesn't cut that, you know? So um, there's a very ready consumer base. And here's the thing. Philippines also has a very large warung class. Now, they don't call it warung there, but they call it micro businesses. And the same goes for India. It's basically the same thing. It's just one, two men businesses, right? They also have the MSME segment classification. And Bukala Park is already stepping into Philippines as well. So you can see that the Salim Group's ambitions are uh, not just contained in Indonesia alone. And here is where the overseas Chinese come in, right? Because overseas Chinese are a loose web of interconnected Chinese tycoons located all over ASEAN. And uh, due to their Chinese heritage, they have, uh, for whatever reason, they have a blood is taken and water kind of relationship. So they're not necessarily loyal to their governments, their countries. They're actually more loyal to each other. For instance, right, I just give you a very funny anecdote. Robert Kwok actually trusted uh, 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 Sudono Salim, right, with his investment in Indonesia's largest flour miller, Bogasari, for 20 years without a shred of paper to prove it, right? And on Sudono Salim's part, he dutifully uh, forwarded 20 years worth of dividends from Mogasari to uh to Robert Kwok without stiffing him, right? With no contract to prove it because at the time, uh, foreigners like Malaysian-born uh, uh, Robert Kwok was not allowed to own strategic business in Indonesia. So there is this funny uh, loyalty among the overseas Chinese tycoons and it exists to this day. For instance, five years ago, both Robert Kwok and Sudan Salim uh, actually uh, entered Indonesia and acquired the second largest retail manufacturer, uh, Goodman Felder, an Australian listed company, right? So this relationship no doubt exists. And uh, the bigger question is this, right? If they're so loyal to each other just because of heritage, who could be pulling the strings behind them, right? So China is, you know, 40% of uh, Robert Kwok's largest business, right? And Robert Kwok is, has a lot of photos with the Chinese premiers, all of them, <laughs> from Deng Xiaoping, right? And um, there is a lot of reason to, to uh, speculate, right, that uh, the overseas Chinese are basically a backdoor of the Chinese economy into the ASEAN economy and to be fair, vice versa, right? So for instance, uh, if Anthony Salim of the Salim Group wants to sell palm oil from Wilma International, one of the subsidiaries, to the edible oil market in China, guess what? He just gives a call to Robert Kwok, right? So with China's growing geoeconomic significance on the global stage, uh, this is no longer just an Indonesian story, nor is it just an ASEAN story. It's also a China story, which makes it all the more exciting. I'll just leave it at there because of brevity, right? The brevity. But um, yeah, go go read up on my part three, book club part three article, 
you will see that there is a lot of potential in the entities owned by the overseas Chinese tycoons who live in ASEAN. Spicy way to finish. I love that. That was so good. Um, yeah, Aaron, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I'll plug all the articles, link them all. Anything else? Where can people find you on Twitter? Um, anything else you want to plug? Yeah, sure. So uh, please uh, have a look at my blog. It's called valueinvesting.substack.com. Right? Uh, I basically write about ASEAN, uh, ASEAN stocks in a value investing context. So I'm actually a fan of Warren Buffett. And he's very investing philosophy. And um, if you want to know more about that, you can read the very investing philosophy articles on my blog. But if you're a value investor and you believe in the Buffett way of doing things, of investing, uh, you know, I'm probably the only guy on Substack who uh, does ASEAN stocks in that uh, fashion, right? So just to give you a bit of context, uh, from... The beginning of COVID, let's say January 2020, right, or February 2020, until today, uh, the S&P 500 has done something at negative 1.5%, right, uh, on over three years. So this is not a Kager, it's an absolute negative 1.5%. The MSCI ASEAN has done something at positive 2.8%, right? If we strip uh, Vietnam out, it's done negative 1.7%. Okay, the MSCI world has done something like around the same, right? Negative 1.3. So if you were to invest in all the stocks on my blog on an equally weighted basis, you would be up about almost 12% right now, right? So uh, uh, on an absolute basis, so it's not Kager. It's from the beginning of 2020, which means that it's a very risk-conscious uh, strategy, right? And of course, I'm sure you've heard it all before, Rule number one, never lose money, right? Your Warren Buffett stuff, your Howard Mark stuff, right? Uh, I'm a true believer in that. And I really do, uh, would like to evangelize that as well, right? Because the Indo-Pacific is here to stay, right? It is the next chapter of growth for investors who are looking for the next China, right? And of course, I understand that uh, people in the developed economies may want more structure, may want less risk, but they want the growth, obviously, Right? So value investing is a very risk-focused strategy which care, prioritizes downside while allowing you to benefit from the macro tailwinds of investing in ASEAN. I think it's a very suitable strategy for emerging market investing as a whole. And uh, if you'd like to know more, come to my blog, visit me on LinkedIn, send me an email. Uh, let's talk. Perfect. I'll link to everything. Totally agree about Indo-Pacific being here to stay and I'm looking forward to it. But um, yeah, Aaron, cheers for coming on today. Makasih ya. Sampai jumpa lagi. Yeah, jumpa lagi. Yeah. Selamat datang. Selamat, selamat. Yeah, you see, my Malay, my Malay is not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, better than mine. So cheers for coming on. <laughs> yeah, yeah.